If you imagine quite far back, you started off MIDI files. Was one of the ways of transmitting music initially over the internet. Then you added things called mod files. Um, these were uh, MIDI files with a very small amount of audio, normally 8-bit audio added to it. You're talking about 1980s video game sort of territory. So it was slightly better sounding than MIDI was, but um, considerably worse than audio was. And then um, uh, compression techniques started to come in with sort of I don't know, 10 to 1, 20 to 1 compression rates. And you could get a mono audio track down to something you could easily download off the internet. So uh, we're talking about uh, uh, digital audio. Um, fascinating uh, topic. I think you've done a, a piece on it before. Just to recap, taking an analog audio stream and then sampling it both that way over time and in that way over amplitude. Slightly less relevant today, but obviously when the internet first got it going, you didn't have much speed, so he wanted to have these files very much reduced. You know, so take an audio file that was quite massive, so squeeze it down so you can uh, push it over a small connection. That led on to the field of audio compression being studied. One of the studies was our understanding of how we hear. Um, so clearly we don't want to encode information that is irrelevant to the way we hear. Um, it requires us to understand how we hear, so let's have a look at that. So if you imagine in your ear itself, this one will be pretty apt. You've got um, uh, an ear, a bunch of little bones, and then you've got what's called a basilar membrane. It's a piece uh, uh, of uh, uh, skin. It's rolled up uh, very much like that. Uh, and then alongside of it, you've got these little hairs. Uh, they're called cilia. Uh, and what happens is, as all the sound comes in, different bits, if you imagine this basilar membrane unrolled, vibrate at different points. If it's a low frequency, it vibrates at one end. If it's a high frequency, it vibrates at the other. That, with the little nerve uh, hairs underneath, then make little nerve firings go up the brain, which enables you to perceive pitch and, and other higher level sort of uh, concepts of sound. Um, because of that rather limited nature of hearing, what happens is if there's a, if there's a loud sound um, in a certain area, because it's a physical membrane, this bit vibrates but makes us desensitized to other frequencies around it. Yeah? And that, that's the basis by which we get to do um, some aspects of compression. That particular bit is called the uh, psychoacoustic effects. Uh, which is how we perceive sound. Is it like the loud sounds kind of like obscured the lower sounds and therefore you can kind of hide a different frequency or something? Uh, the loud sounds obscure the less loud sounds around a certain frequency because of that physical membrane representation of the frequencies. Um, and then there's been huge amounts of studies to understand how much it affects it to what degree. Um, what you do is then you take your digital audio and you can imagine doing this yourself if you were uh, and if you've ever done an audio multi-track uh, system, you know, sort of, uh, there's a whole of them out there, Cubase, what, whatever, um, uh, Pro Tools. Um, take your audio track, which would be a constant audio stream. Um, you can imagine filtering it out into all its frequency bands, let's say from, um, you know, 20 hertz to 100 hertz, from 100 hertz to 500 hertz, and so on and so on. And then you can imagine um, sampling them at different rates. So this one might be 8-bit, this one might be 16-bit, this one might be 24-bit. And you know by sampling things at different rates, you, you effectively add a bit of noise to it, but you reduce the overall amount of um, bits you need to represent it. Um, so you lower the quality, but obviously yes. you're obviously lowering the file size. Well. Yes, but you're lowering the quality in such a way that because of the other sounds that are going on, you, you can't perceive it. Uh, and if you, if you plotted that out, so this would be called a psychoacoustic mask, uh, and that means you can reduce the amount of bits you need to describe something, um, but um, uh, you can make very small perceptual differences to the overall sound, and that, that's one of the, the core tenets. So it's sort of um, using the, the rather um, you know, uh, oddities of the way our hearing system has, has evolved, which is you know, far from perfect, obviously, um, uh, to take advantage of that and then reduce the amount of data. And then you can do your normal sort of um, compression tricks, which work for any type of data stream, like I keep seeing this string of digits come up, so I'm going to put those up in a lookup table and, and encode it more efficiently than just encoding those bits each time. No different than, say, Morse code does by saying, well, you use certain letters more than you do others, so I'm going to attribute a short key length to those. 
Uh, and there's actually a whole technique around that. They're called Huffman trees for anybody who wants to look them up. Fascinating things. So you, you get, you know, all of the other aspects of information coding come into play. But that, that sort of a psychoacoustic bit is the bit that's very audio centric. So you know, it's the bit that has quite a lot of relevancy. So that, and then there's no other tricks like if you've got a stereo channel, sort of comparing them in some way or, or and taking information out that way. But that's the sort of basic tenets of compression. Now that absolutely then opened up the internet to music. Does compression still work in the same way now? If you've, somebody's you know listening to Spotify and streaming audio, is it there? Are there any other tricks they use? Oh uh, well, they had lots of more uh, trips. I I always um, uh, for me sort of compare this to any sort of innovation. So. Uh, sorry, this is slightly obscure, but if you take the something like steam engine revolution, there was major innovations, and then people filled in all of the gaps. Um, uh, in steam engine, it was the notion that there was a steam engine that you drive a piston off, and then you can pump water out of a mine, and then people put wheels on it and turn it to a train, and all the other sorts of things. But the the fundamentals of it stay the same. Um, the um, uh, the uh, people have then done significant innovations inside of that, but the notion there is an understanding of how you hear, that clearly gets better over time, so that bit's Im improved. Then there's a notion of um, all of the encoding tricks you can go do on information sources, so this is like encoding it as better um, uh, Huffman trees or whatever the modern equivalents thereof. Um, so you get those pieces, but I think the fundamental tenets have stayed the same, um, just the, you know, the, the overall increases. Uh, have got um, better. Interesting also, obviously, bandwidth constraints have come down. So the pressure has come off it a little bit as well in terms of an overall need. When you come to this node and you say, I'm now going to descend to the left again, the rule is you add a zero to what you've already got. So you end up with zero, zero. How about this state? You come down on a zero, but then you go to the right. Every time you go to the right,